the last time I talked to uh, SBAG about uh, Caesar, and a lot has happened in a year. So I'm going to try to bring you quickly up to date. Uh, status is, uh, of course, 12 proposals were submitted to NASA for the next New Frontiers mission in April of 2017. Uh, NASA down-selected to two finalists a little over a year ago. Uh, and then we had a year to produce our Step 2 proposal, also called a Concept Study Report. And we submitted ours to NASA on December 14th, uh, 2018. Generating a Concept Study Report is a very intense process. Uh, in generating our CSR and gen doing our Step 2 work, we spent about one, we spent about three times the money and one third the time compared to step one. Uh, so it's essentially an order of magnitude more uh, intense in experience. And we expect one mission to be selected sometime this coming summer. In case you're wondering what one of these documents looks like, here it is, 1,600 pages, that's eight kilograms of paper. Um, fortunately, we only had to print out two of them. Um, if you take away one message from our presentation today, it's this one. We remain completely committed to delivering a common nuclear sample of the highest possible scientific value to the small bodies and planetary materials communities. That's what CSER is all about. It's all about the sample. Um, there have been no major changes uh, to the project since step one. Uh, we have changed none of our mission goals, mission objectives, level one size requirements are identical, payload requirements are identical. So no changes to any of those. Uh, there have been no changes to the project leadership team, uh, to any of the key organizational roles and responsibilities. Uh, sample return date is still what it is in 2038, and all of our technical and programmatic margins remain robust. So what we've been primarily doing in step two is building and testing lots and lots of hardware. And the objective of that has been risk reduction and maturation of technologies, getting everything to TRL-6, uh, and getting rid of all the risks that we can, that we can retire at this stage of the game. Uh, this is the project leadership team, uh, unchanged from left to right. That's Keiko Nakamura Messenger from uh, here at JSC. She's the Deputy Principal Investigator. Martin Houghton from NASA Goddard. Martin is our Project Systems Engineer. Uh, next is Donya Douglas Bradshaw, Deputy Project Manager. Uh, me in the middle, um, then uh, Vicki Moran, also Deputy Project Manager. Our project manager is Dave Mitchell, most recently was project manager for the very successful Maven development. And uh, then on the right, uh, Alex Hayes from Cornell. Alex is the PI designee. Uh, 60 days after launch, I retire, and I hand the keys to Alex, and I sit back and watch the show. It's the first proposal I've ever written where we had to put in a succession plan. Um, this is our key partner organizations. I'm not going to take you through all of them. The organizational structure is exactly as it was. The only change is really a change in name only, and that is that Orbital ATK has been acquired by Northrop Grumman. Orbital ATK has been preserved as an independent operating unit within Northrop Grumman, uh, but we are now getting our spacecraft from Northrop Grumman as opposed to, it'll have a Northrop Grumman logo on it instead of a, an Orbital ATK logo on it. But we're working with exactly the same people at exactly the same facility. Uh, this is an eye chart. I'm not gonna list everything for you, but the point here is that we've been trying to run Caesar like a flight project from the beginning. I mean, even from step one. So even back in step one, we had things like flight system configuration management, doc document change control. We have a change control board that meets regularly. In fact, the next one is in a couple of days. Um, risk management process, all the kinds of processes that you typically associate with an active flight project, we've tried to institute from the start. And that's an approach that has served us well. Uh, any of you who have been deeply involved in flight projects know that you also produce a large number of documents. And we have a lot of those documents now done uh, in the sense that they are released, project, formally released project documents under change control, whole bunch of them. I'm not going to list them for you, but level one requirements, mission requirements. You can see down here some of the important ones, our science data management plan, our curation plan, our sample analysis plan, many, many interface control documents, a whole bunch of other stuff is done uh, at this point. So we're, we're staying busy. Uh, we have made two changes to additions to the co-investigator team. Uh, we've added Julie Mitchell. Julie is here at JSC. Julie is the, um, curation, is the curator for ISIS and Organics here at JSC. She has taken over as our curation lead. Uh, in step one, Keiko Nakamura Messenger had, had a lot of work to do. She was both deputy principal investigator and our curation lead. 
to offload Keiko a little bit and let her focus exclusively on being deputy PI. Uh, we brought, up, brought on Julie uh, as our uh, curation lead. And then Jonathan Lenina Cornell. Jonathan was somebody I wanted to have on my team from the start, but he was PI on his own uh, New Frontiers proposal with two pro proposals coming out of the same floor of the same building at Cornell. We just decided, decided we would do things separately for step one, and, and so now Jonathan's on our team for step two. Uh, this is what our spacecraft looked like in step one. It was a big brute then, it's a big brute now. Uh, this is the most recent design of the spacecraft. Uh, 43 meters from wingtip to wingtip. We got great big solar arrays because we go very far from the sun. Uh, externally, the only really visible change in spacecraft configuration is we've gone to this elliptical high gain antenna as opposed to the circular one uh, that we had before. Meets, the, meets all the same uh, performance requirements, but it's a, it's a better packaging configuration. It fits much more nicely inside the launch vehicle fairing because there's a lot more room to breathe there. Internally, the only significant change is that we've gone from three xenon tanks to two, and that's just a more efficient uh, packaging arrangement. Otherwise, configuration mechanically is pretty much the same. This is the space, spacecraft in the touch and go, the sampling configuration, the tag configuration. This is the last thing the uh, comet sees before we grab a piece of it. Solar arrays, feathered back, tag arm, extended. I'll show you a little bit more detail on both of those in a moment. Um, we have put a lot of effort into spacecraft hardware development. For the most part, most of the stuff on the spacecraft was well, well above TRL-6, or a lot was at TRL-6 at the time of step one. So where we have focused our efforts is in some of the lower TRL areas, uh, places where we want to bring the TRL up, and they tend to be focused very much on the, on the power system and the ion propulsion system for understandable reasons, given the nature of our emissions. So here's a high voltage relay assembly uh, development unit that we have built and thermal back tested, uh, test article for the xenon tanks, test article for the, for the uh, SEP thruster, the ion propulsion system thruster, that's a big, big deal for us. And then, oh my goodness, the solar arrays. Uh, solar arrays are being uh, built for us by deployable state systems out in Goleta, California. I've been out there a bunch of times. This is a full scale Caesar sized solar array wing, watching this thing deploy is just, is just magnificent. It's a beautiful thing to see, and it's just bloody huge. Uh, but there it is, and it works. Um, camera suite provided by Mail and Space Sciences. Uh, you can see mechanical drawings of all the cameras down here. Uh, cameras themselves, the hardware on which they're all based, they're all based on cameras that Mail and Space Sciences has flown. Uh, we've got a narrow angle camera, mid angle camera for nucleus mapping. Tag cam for documenting the tag event itself, navigation cameras, and then a device we call CanCam, which actually is mounted inside the sample acquisition system and takes real video of the sample being acquired uh, from inside the container as it happens. Uh, this shows how the cameras are accommodated. The key point to take away here is that most of the cameras, all the remote sensing cameras, are mounted on a very stiff optical bench. And what that does is provide very stable co-alignment. We also have our inertial reference unit mounted on the very same optical bench. And so the spacecraft attitude control system is very, very tightly tied to the pointing of the cameras. Uh, there's CAN CAM inside the sample acquisition system, and the TAG CAM is mounted here on the sample return capsule support cylinder and views the end of the uh, TAG arm during the sample process. Um, most of the cameras, as I said, were based very closely on cameras that Malin has flown, and so we didn't have a lot of development work. The one place where we did have significant work where we weren't quite at TRL-6 was the focus, mism, focus mechanism for the narrow angle camera. We had the resources and the time available in step one to simply kill this problem, so we did. Uh, so this is, this is a CAD model of the focus mechanism, but there it is. We actually built one integrated it with a uh, camera structure that was a uh, leftover from the LRO program, uh, put it in thermal vacuum, and tested it over its full uh, operating range and, and thermal range, and it's performed just great. So we, we tried that, that was uh, We've done a lot of work on uh, design of proximity operations, how the spacecraft will operate near the comet to DC, Cool. This is some of the low-altitude cases that we do to look at the specific tag sites on the 
surface viewed in a nucleus fixed reference frame. So you can see the, the, the complexity of the tra trajectories that the spacecraft fly. And these have all been, been designed out in, in great deal detail now at this point. Uh, this is another video, and I'll take the time to play this because this is pretty cool. Uh, so what you're seeing here, this is a depiction of the entire tag process. You can see the view in one of our nav cams here. Here's the nucleus model. Here's the spacecraft with the solar arrays feathered back. The key point here is this is not just a cartoon animation. This is what you're actually seeing is the output of a full six degree of freedom uh, simulation of the entire tag process that takes into account uh, maneuver execution errors, uh, all the things that affect the, the ability of the spacecraft to, uh, uh, to fly down to the nucleus surface. So we are now flying down to what we call checkpoint. There it is. Uh, you can see the altimetry above the surface as provided by our laser rangefinder, uh, flying down to match point. Shadow of the spacecraft there. And once, what we do is basically we do a series of four propulsive maneuvers with our hydrazine propulsion system, uh, each one computing a firing solution from the pictures that we get from the images. And if either the images or the laser range finder tell us that we're out of the descent corridor we mean to be on, we then automatically and autonomously execute a, uh, uh, an abort burn and we back out. So at this point, we're now in terminal descent down to the surface, uh, or straight above the tag site, we're simply falling under the influence of the comet's very weak gravity. Uh, if you note, know, here's the tag arm. There is a compression link in the forearm. The constant force spring compresses, get five seconds or more of surface contact, and then we fire thrusters and get the hell out of there. Uh, here is the tag arm. It's pretty long. It's about five meters long. There have been two significant changes, two significant improvements to the tag arm uh, since step one. One of them was something that just that should have been obvious and should have hit us from the start. You'll see in a moment that the way that we determine the mass of how much sample we've gotten is by swinging the arm, generating a centripetal, centripetal, centripetal acceleration, and then measuring the mass using a force torque sensor. If you mount the force source torque sensor in an elbow, fixture like this, you get improved uh, resolution, you get improved performance of the, the mass measurement. So we've, we've got, before we had it just in kind of a hockey puck here at the wrist, but this is a much better way to mount it. So we get improved performance there. The other thing is that we've gone to beefier actuators. The actuators that we had before were from Goddard's Restore L program. Uh, we decided after doing some structural analysis that we wanted to have a, a beefier, stronger arm. And so we beef that up by going to the same actuators that are used on the Mars 2020 rover. This is the engineering model of the Mars 2020 arm. There are the actuators. They are both structurally stronger and they're also just more technically mature. Uh, so it gives us a better story in a couple of respects. We've got some of those now. These are pictures taken just a few weeks ago. Uh, these are tag arm segments. Here are some of the tag arm actuators. And we expect to have a fully assembled and functioning tag arm within the next six to eight weeks. As I said, the way we measure sample mass is by weighing it. We swing the arm, uh, and then we measure the force, the change in force out at the, uh, out at the wrist at the end effector. So we do one swing before we collected the sample, and then we do another swing afterwards, and we compare those. Now, testing this, is, this has been an interesting experience. Um, in principle, it's a very simple thing, just swinging it and you're measuring force. But in order to test it effectively, what you need is a gravity offload table, and you need a really, really, really smooth one. Uh, because what you're trying to do is eliminate noise sources, and one of the primary noise sources, if you've got one of these gravity offload tables, is the bump, 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 bump that you get if you have any irregularities in your table. And so what people use for these things typically are these poured epoxy floors. They're very smooth but they're not perfect. And so to absolutely do this test right, what you need is a super smooth table and the state of the art, the, the gold standard in this business is granite. So we are the proud owners of the biggest slab of granite in North America. It cost me $40,000 just to ship this thing across the country. Um, but yes, this, is, this has been installed at our, at our robotics lab at the University of West Virginia. And uh, super smooth, super flat, 
super heavy, super expensive, and it works super well. Uh, here's a video of one of our tests. It doesn't look like much, but that's really exciting to me. Um, and what we have found is that we can get the mass of the sample. We can, we can easily meet the, the 20 gram uh, accuracy requirement for sample mass. And so that's, that's worked out for us very well. Uh, this is our sample acquisition system. Looks like something Darth Vader would have in his living room. Um, the way you test this in zero G and vacuum, we've done a very, very extensive test program at NASA's Zero Gravity Research Facility at Glenn Research Center. This is an amazing facility. It's a 580 foot deep vacuum chamber uh, lined with steel, capped at both ends. You load your test article into uh, this drop vehicle, cap it off, drop it, and it lands, I swear to God, into a giant vat of styrofoam peanuts at the bottom of the fall, and you get 5.18 seconds of super clean zero gravity and vacuum. We need five. Um, we have spent weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks at this facility. Test team, here's uh, our test article in test chamber before we dropped it. In step one, what we focused on in our testing in NASA Glenn was refining the design, settling on the actual design characteristics, showing that we could make, meet the, the basic sampling requirements. Step two has been focused on torture, testering, torture testing this thing, basically trying to test it under a wide range of off nominal conditions. Uh, ones that we have focused on, first of all, is adhesion, taking particles that are stuck together. That if, if there's been some kind of sintering, if there's been something that has increased the strength of the material, we depend on these ripper times to penetrate into it, to splay out, and to break the stuff up. Uh, we have found a way to make material of con controlled strength uh, and glue it together. You basically soak it in the glue and let it dry. And we have shown that the system works well with uh, particle strength, that, or excuse me, with surface strength, bearing strength that's uh, 10 times greater than what was observed when a Philae lander bounced off the surface of Churyumov Gerasimenko, which is the comet we're going to. We've also tried torture testing it by putting lots and lots and lots of big chunks in the aperture of the sampler, but what happens is because this is a pneumatic sampler, the little chunks just kind of flow around the big chunks. So in both cases, we found that, that we significantly exceed the uh, sample mass collection requirements even when we sort of do pretty nasty things to this uh, sampler. Once we acquire the sample, we put it into our sample and gas containment systems. I've described this to this group before. Uh, the design of this has changed a little bit, but not much. This shows an exploded view of it. Um, here's the sample containment system, which hermetically seals the sample. This is the gas tank into which we passively cryopump the volatiles that come off of this. Uh, the two primary changes to this design uh, just a couple of mechanical improvements. One is that we managed to enlarge this radiator so it does an even better job of keeping the tank cool. The other is that our mechanical engineers got really quite clever about the way they packaged some of our plumbing and valves and so forth, which I'll show you uh, better in a moment. But, but we were able to add some nice things to the design because they were able to improve the packaging. Um, so that, that was, of course, the rendering. Here's the actual hardware sample containment system, gas containment system. Um, our sample containment system testing has been, again, focused very much on torture testing, the thing. Uh, we want to make sure that it will seal appropriately and hold a hermetic seal at a low enough leak rate uh, when it's sealed at very low temperatures, also in a very dusty, dirty environment in case that happens. And so we've done a lot of testing uh, at low temperatures with lots of dirt on seals. The way it works is by driving a, a steel uh, knife blade into a copper gasket, so it's a knife edge steel. And we've gotten very good performance uh, even when we, we do pretty nasty things to it. Uh, two improvements that we've made to the sample containment system and, and gas containment system. One is that we have changed the materials with which we coat uh, these pieces of hardware. What we want to do is we want to assure that everything is non-reactive with the comet gases that we collect. And in step one, we proposed using gold, chemically inert, easy to, to deposit and so forth. But we looked at that more carefully in step two and we decided to move away from gold for two reasons. One is that it's pretty soft. 
And what we found is in some of the tests we ran when we would simulate pieces of comet sample coming into the sample container and dinging up the gold, it could damage the surface uh, and expose the reactive stuff underneath. We didn't like that. There also, uh, after doing some thermodynamic calculations, we came to realize that there are some reactions that can take place uh, between gold and HCN. It forms these uh, dicyanoorate compounds, and that's a, that's a form of corrosion, effectively, of the sample container and modifying the, the, the uh, gas sample. Now, you do the numbers on this, and the reaction kinetics are very slow at the kind of temperatures we're talking about. But the combination of those two things just made us sufficiently nervous that we decided to move away from gold. So we use now two different coatings inside the sample containment system, and on the sample container itself, we now use platinum. Uh, it's not quite as pretty, but uh, it works better. It doesn't. It is not subject to those uh, reactions that I mentioned, and it's a lot tougher. It's just a lot stronger than gold, and so it's not going to get dinged up by the particles coming in. Um, elsewhere, we have gone to this wonderful material, which I really only learned about in step two, uh, called silk alloy. And silk alloy is a vapor-deposited, ultra-pure elemental silicon, and it is absolutely non-reactive to the kind of gases that we're talking about. The beautiful thing about it uh, a, it's non-reactive. The other thing is because it's chemical vapor deposited, we got a lot of nooks and crannies in the plumbing and the valves and the tanks here, and it just goes everywhere, and it coats everything. You might ask, well, why not use it on the sample container too? Well, because it's not that mechanically strong. It's not that mechanically robust, and so we're a little bit worried it might get things up. It has flown. Uh, it's been thermal vacuum tested and vibe tested and all of that, uh, but we decided to split up platinum here and uh, uh, silk alloy here. We have done uh, long-term exposure of both of these materials to comet gas analogs that include water, H2S, HDN. Uh, we don't see any changes to the surfaces of these things uh, with SEM, XRF, micro ramen, or any changes to uh, the GCMS uh, signature of the headspace gases. Um, and so we feel really pretty confident that uh, we're going to be able to, to both, both, both from knowledge of these materials and these experiments that we'll be able to uh, avoid reactions within uh, the system. Um, the other testing that we've done a lot of has to do with the gas transfer time scale. What we're doing is we're warming the sample up to about minus 30 degrees C, driving gases off of it, allowing those to evolve into the gas containment system, and we want to do that fast enough that we don't have any alteration of the solid sample take place. Uh, we've done a lot of, I mean, weeks and weeks and weeks of thermal vac vacuum testing of this thing under a variety of circumstances uh, with background gases in the system and so forth. And uh, what we find is that even for a very ice-rich sample, one that has 20 grams of water in it, uh, we can get all the water vapor transferred from the, the solid sample out of it and into the GCS in less than two weeks and minus 30 C. Uh, we've also done a bunch of experiments in Japan. In fact, they're under, still underway now, which is taking, we've made three different classes of amorphous silica nanoparticles that could be examples of the most alterable stuff that you might find in your sample. Uh, we've exposed it to vapor that's evolved from a mixture of H2O and NH3. Um, and we did these experiments at minus 20, uh, as opposed to the minus 30 that will actually be asked. That provides some margin there. And we find no evidence at all of alteration after 60 days of exposure. Why did we stop in 60 days? Because there was a great big earthquake. Uh, <laughs> we had a magnitude 6.8 earthquake outside of Sapporo that wrecked our uh, experiment, so we had to start over again. Uh, we pulled samples at 60 days, no evidence of alteration, so we've at least got a factor of four margin on this, and we've got some 120-day exposures that are still underway. Uh, let's see, just to wrap things up, the sample return capsule. Of course, the sample return capsule is coming from, to us from JAXA. Uh, they were the developers of the successful sample return capsule on the Hayabusa mission, and of course, Hayabusa 2, which is in flight now. And our sample return capsule is a scaled up version of that. Uh, this shows how the GCS closes up, and then there's a mechanism that closes uh, the sample return capsule itself. Uh, we take the entire spacecraft, put it on a collision course with Utah. Uh, release the sample return capsule, put the spacecraft on a divert trajectory, 
The nice thing about this sample return capsule, well, several nice things, but this is one of them right here. Uh, the JAXA design, and this is a big part of why I picked JAXA as a sample return capsule provider, drops the front heat shield while it's still in flight. And what we're trying to do is trying to keep that sample cold uh, all the way down to the ground and all the way into a cold storage unit on the surface. We don't want to melt any of the ice, the water ice that's in the sample, uh, and jettisoning the front heat shield before any of that heat from the reentry soaks back into the sample is an enormous advantage um, and works very well for us. And our, our thermal design, we believe, will give us about four to five hours on the ground in Utah before we would have to worry about the sample melting. And part of the way we achieve that you see right here, right here, these are housings that contain dodecane. It's a phase change material, has a melting temperature of about minus 10. And so as the sample is sitting on the ground in Utah starts to warm up, when it gets to minus 10, it just plateaus. And so all that, all that uh, phase change is taking place, so it buys us hours on the ground. And you can see the phase change material housings here. So we were pretty confident from past experience that it would be possible to recover the sample return capsule and get it into cold storage uh, in considerably less than four to five hours. But we decided that we wanted to prove that. Oh, sorry, I left out one thing here. Uh, we've been building a lot of sample return capsule hardware. Uh, this is testing of the parachute te system that has taken place already. Uh, we've got a big drop test of the entire drogue chute and main chute system that's going to take place on Izu Oshima, uh, island off the coast of Japan, in two weeks. Um, yes, so as I was getting to, uh, we decided we wanted to actually convince ourselves that we could get this, we could find this sample return capsule with this parachute, get out there with helicopters, pick it up, get it into a mobile cold storage unit, and do it in a time that was short compared to four or five hours. So we got together the people and the helicopters and everything that we needed. We did a bunch of scenarios, uh, scenarios where it landed you know, one sigma close to us, others where it landed three sigma away from us, others where the parachute unfortunately detached so you couldn't see it from the air, others in which there were no fly conditions so you could, we had to actually drive a vehicle, we couldn't get to it with a helicopter. Uh, what was the other one? Oh yeah, Lisa, we, um, the one where we gave the helicopter pilots incorrect uh, vectors to the to the to the uh, site, and they got there, and the helicopter and the SRC wasn't there, and they had to go find it. And at least you can have to refresh my memory, but if I recall, of all the scenarios we ran, I think the slowest between when we tell, told the helicopters to go and when we got uh, the space the uh, SRC in the cold storage is about 45 minutes. So we feel real, real confident now, having actually gone out and done it, that we can that we can beat that four or five hours. Um, we put a lot of effort into curation, a lot of effort into planning our sample analysis. This is just a favorite uh, image of mine from the released version of our curation plan. And there's the cover of our 70 some odd page sample analysis plan. We've gotten a lot done. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Questions? Uh, two questions. First, do you, given particularly given how long the mission is, are you proposing to have a participating scientist? Oh yeah, yeah. Good, good question. Are we proposing to have a participating scientist program? Yes, but moreover, this is something new that we put into our step two proposal. Is we also propose to, propose to NASA what's called a science enhancement option, where we are proposing that starting about three years before. The samples actually get back to Earth, that NASA invest in instrument development uh, and laboratories of investigators who propose to that program uh, so that to, to really build up the, the instrument capabilities that exist within the community uh, at the time that the samples come back. So yes, we, we expect to do both of those. And second, uh, understanding that the sample is the top priority or the only priority, <laughs> do you have a uh, reconnaissance period before you before you do the sampling, and do you anticipate looking or observing Rosetta on the surface? Yes, yes. So uh, we do have uh, an extensive period of mapping the nucleus once we get there. One of the nice things about our mission design is that we have way, way, way more time at our target. It's just the nature of the trajectory that we fly in the orbit of the comet. We get four and a half years 
at this nucleus, which is a lot more than Osiris Rex has at Bennu. It's a lot more than Hayabusa has at Ryugu. And we already have a, a set of images of what, what uh, a tree of across America looks like. Now, it will have gone through two perihelion passages by the time we get to it, and so changes are expected. And so we make no assumptions. Our, our, our plan assumes complete mapping. So we will produce a complete global map of Shuriyama Kurasa Menko that is better, higher resolution, uh, both in terms of the terrain model that we produce and the images that we produce than was produced by Rosetta. And that will do a lovely job of documenting any changes that have taken place over those two perihelion passages. So, you know, our motto is it's all about the sample and we have used that principle to drive all of the choices, all the design decisions that we have made. But simply by virtue of doing what you must do to make a map of the nucleus to assure safe sampling anyway, you kind of, for free, if you will, uh, get some very, very nice comments on it as well. Yeah, two questions. Uh, how many times can you go down to the surface in terms of attempts to get a sample? <laughs> Okay, the number of tag attempts that we can support is at least three. And that's, that's, that's two rehearsals followed by a tag, two rehearsals followed by a tag, two rehearsals followed by a tag. We have margin on top of that. And if you allow yourself to reduce the number of rehearsals, of course, it's, it's even more. So we, we, we've got more, at least as much and possibly more than what Osiris Rex has. And the second question was, um, in terms of the, the cameras in the for the sampling yeah. uh, and the actual tag, uh, tag camera, yeah. uh, what's the resolution that you will have for both of those instruments and, and how much, when you lift it off again, will you be able to get resolution you know, considerations of debris and things like that? Yeah, the, 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 uh, okay, so you're testing my memory, but the tag cam, the, yeah, the question is about the resolution of the tag cam, can cam. Uh, it's sort of millimeter scale for the tag cam and sub-millimeter with inside the, the uh, the sample container itself. The sample container has a sapphire window. We have a camera that views through that. Uh, so the, the, the resolution of both of those is, is quite high. Now, as, as we back away, you know, the resolution will decrease as we get further and further from the surface. But, you know, the, the imaging distance at the time of tag is, is about five meters. So you can sort of work it out from that. And did you have another one? No, that was I just okay. interested in the surface. Yeah. Right. Okay, any more questions or online? Okay, I'll let you. Sure. Um, so, how do you make sure that, for example, for some of these cameras, the sampling cameras, we have really large solar arrays and right. they introduce a lot of partial body to the vehicle? How do you make sure that when you're trying to you know, zero in on a fairly small sample um, area, uh, how do you control the vehicle? Yeah, we've actually done a lot of simulations of that. We've got a full-up Adams model of the spacecraft, and we've, we've done dynamic simulations of the solar arrays. Um, the solar arrays are, you've got two things going for you. One is the nature of these, this particular solar array technology is an interesting one. It's the ROSA or roll-out solar arrays. And what you have are you have these two spars on either side of the array uh, that are um, graphite epoxy tubes kind of split down the middle, and then you you roll them flat, okay? And then basically it's just their springs and it's stored energy and they, they just roll out under their own stored energy and in the end they form a structure that's very, very stiff. So the natural stiffness of these things is pretty good to begin with. The other thing is that the mass of these things is pretty low. They're big and long, but they don't have a lot of mass. We got, I mean, we're carrying around a ton of xenon or something. I mean, the spacecraft mass itself is, is substantial with all that xenon on board. So the, the perturbations that the uh, solar rays introduced, according to the, you know, the, the models that we've run, are, are small enough that they don't. Uh, we, we, we include that in our pointing uncertainty budget, and we meet our requirements. That's the best way to put it. Other questions or online? All right. Thanks, Steve. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay. And, oh, sorry. and we'll do that. All right. And next up. Um,